we're talking about our sponsor, Fume. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. And instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses delicious flavors. You get it. Instead of bad, Fume is good. It's a habit you're free to enjoy and makes replacing your bad habit easy. Join Fume, accelerating humanity's breakup from destruction habits by picking up the journey pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code SCARY to save 10% off when you get the journey pack today. That's tryfume.com and use code SCARY to save an additional 10% off your order today. ZocDoc is a free app where you can find amazing doctors and book appointments online. We're talking about thousands of top-rated patient-reviewed doctors and specialists. You can filter specifically from ones who take your insurance, are located near you, and treat almost any condition you're searching for. Book an appointment with a few taps in their app and start feeling better faster with ZocDoc. Go to ZocDoc.com slash something and download the ZocDoc app for free. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash something zocdoc.com slash something hello i'm blair bathory and this is the something scary podcast thank you so much for being here whether this is your first time or you're one of the brave souls who join us every week we love that friday the 13th falls in october this year our spookiest month Statistically, this is actually very rare, as others are gearing up for playful movie nights and superstitious tradition. We know the truth. We must be on the lookout for the darker side of Friday the 13th, the date that calls for the supernatural to reveal itself, a date that can make rational humans go insane, a time when nefarious spirits come out to do their evil bidding, a night that can be so unlucky, it just might kill you. First, the sins of my mother, followed by a bad influence, then an unlucky rabbit's foot. Finally, in our featured story, a deadly past. So, wanna hear something scary? Friday. The 13th. Just because you can avoid a problem for a short while doesn't mean it won't haunt you forever. Like in this story inspired by Anonymous. Ominous clouds gathered in the sky that Friday the 13th. I begged my mother to let me stay home from school, anxiety gnawing at my insides. It was an unusual request for me. Typically, I love school, but something about this particular day filled me with dread. My granddad, who was visiting, noticed my distress. He asked me gently why I didn't want to go to school. I took a deep breath and confessed the reason that had been haunting my thoughts. It's Friday the 13th, I said, my voice trembling. Terrible things always happen to me today. My mother chuckled dismissing my fears as childish imagination fueled by horror movies. It's just a day like any other, she insisted. Nothing to worry about. But Granddad, his eyes filled with a knowing intensity, leaned in closer, encouraging me to tell him everything. Reluctantly, I recounted the grim incidents that had happened on previous Friday the 13th. There was the time I got sick and missed my best friend's birthday party, Then came the memory of the car accident that had left me with a broken arm. I had to miss playing the entire baseball season. Most devastating of all was when our beloved dog, Chewy, passed away last Friday the 13th. My granddad listened in silence, absorbing each word. When I finished, he finally spoke, his voice laden with a grave solemnity. It's the curse of Amelia he said, sending a shiver down my spine. He began to tell a dark tale that had been passed down through generations of our family. In 1685, there lived a young woman named Amelia. She had been orphaned when her mother, a healer in their small town, was accused of witchcraft and burned at the stake. 
Amelia had watched her mother die a horrific death, surrounded by the cheering townsfolk who had once sought her mother's healing remedies. After her mother's death, Amelia vowed to live a secluded life, steering clear of the cruel inhabitants. During her solitary walks into town, she noticed a young man about her age who always seemed to be watching her from afar. His friendly smile eventually disarmed her and they exchanged glances and waves over the course of several months. One day, the young man approached her. He spoke of his beautiful garden, inviting her to visit his home to see it for herself. Excited at the possibility of finally freeing herself from the past and moving with her life, she agreed to meet him. They set a date for that Friday the 13th. After meeting at their usual spot, the young man led Amelia to his house. However, when they arrived at the back of the property, Amelia was stunned. There were no vibrant flowers. Instead, the landscape consisted of barren rocks, dirt, and a large pile of logs. An unsettling feeling crept over her as the young man's friendly demeanor shifted. He suddenly grabbed her arm and dragged her toward the woodpile. Amelia's heart pounded in her chest as she realized his house looked eerily familiar. It was a house her mother had warned her to never enter, but she had never questioned why. The young man pushed open the creaking door and forcefully pushed Amelia inside. Terror coursed through Amelia as she cried out and struggled to break free from his grip. He remained silent, his eyes fixed upon her with a deranged expression. As despair took hold, Amelia realized this might be the end of her. He bound her tightly to a wooden log and lit a fire beneath her, the flames whipping around her flesh. Through her agonized screams, he revealed his true motive. Her mother, the healer, had been responsible for the death of his father during one of the lightning storms they claimed she had brought to the town. He believed Amelia deserved to die like her mother. No one wanted any witches in their town. Amelia's cries of pain eventually transformed into manic laughter as the fire consumed her. In her final moments, she uttered a chilling curse. A curse be unto you on every Friday the 13th for you, your offspring, and all future generations. Those were her last words, sealing a dreadful fate for the family yet to come. My granddad had long suspected that the young man in the story was our ancestor, passing down the curse from one generation to the next. He convinced my mother to allow me to stay home. We spent the day doing good deeds and acts of kindness, praying that the curse of Amelia would someday be lifted from our family, sparring future members from the horrors of that terrible day and allowing them to simply enjoy Friday the 13th. Does your family have any dark secrets in their past? Something terrible they're trying to hide from the world? How was the secret uncovered? Cold turkey may be great on sandwiches, but there's a better way to break your bad habits. We're not talking about some weird mind voodoo from your crazy neighbor or your friend that comes and reads your horoscope. We're talking about our sponsor, Fume, and they look at the problem in a different way. Not everything in a bad habit is wrong. So instead of a drastic, uncomfortable change, why not just remove the bad from your habit? Fume is an innovative, award-winning flavored air device that does just that. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. And instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses delicious flavors. You get it, instead of bad, Fume is good. It's a habit you're free to enjoy and makes replacing your bad habit easy. Your fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial and is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidget fidgeting, giving your fingers a lot to do, which is helpful for de-stressing and anxiety while breaking your habit. The taste, the first time I tried it, was really flavorful and it kind of reminded me of a fresh herbal tea. And the feel, it's well weighted and it fits in my hand and it's perfectly balanced and extremely fun to fidget with. Stopping is something we can all put off because it's hard, but switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume, accelerating humanity's breakup from destruction habits by picking up the journey pack today. 
head to tryfume.com and use code SCARY to save 10% off when you get the journey pack today. That's tryfume.com and use code SCARY to save an additional 10% off your order today. Have you ever known that you need a new doctor but have been too busy to look for one? And then suddenly you need to see a doctor and you are scrambling to get a recommendation and make an appointment. If that sounds familiar, then ZocDoc is for you. ZocDoc makes finding a new doctor so easy. You don't need to ask everyone you know for a reference. ZocDoc is a place to not only find a doctor, but to find one that has amazing reviews and takes your insurance. And many have appointments available within 24 hours. ZocDoc is a free app where you can find amazing doctors and book appointments online. We're talking about thousands of top-rated patient-reviewed doctors and specialists. You can filter specifically from ones who take your insurance, are located near you, and treat almost any condition you're searching for. Book an appointment with a few taps in their app and start feeling better, faster with ZocDoc. It really couldn't be easier. I use ZocDoc and you should too. Go to ZocDoc.com slash something and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash something, ZocDoc.com slash something. Change can usually be a good thing, but sometimes changing things up will literally kill you. Like in this story inspired by Hoy Hilder Frey. Kayla, Lynn, and Ellie were inseparable. They had a strong friendship and they spent almost every weekend together sharing secrets and dreams. Then all of a sudden, Lynn couldn't stop talking about a new friend she had made on her block. It struck the others as odd because Lynn was the shyest among them. She was the type to stay in her comfort zone, not actively seeking new friends, especially from a different school. Kayla and Ellie weren't particularly thrilled on adding a fourth member to their close-knit group. But when Lynn mentioned that Justine's parents were out of town and that they were all invited to her house for a Friday the 13th party, their excitement overshadowed any reservations they might have had. On that much anticipated evening, they all arrived at Justine's house ready for a fun night. They quickly settled in, watching a bunch of horror movies, munching on candy and popcorn until the inevitable question arose, what should they do next? It was Justine who suggested something more daring, summoning a ghost. The idea sent shivers down Lynn's spine, her face turning pale. Her hesitation was evident, but Kayla and Ellie were eager for adventure and the three outvoted her. Curiosity peaked. Kayla asked how the game was played. Justine smirked and cautioned them. It's very dangerous. But the girls already huddled in a circle weren't deterred. Justine moved with precision, as though she had performed this ritual before. She disturbed the candles, dimmed the lights, grabbed spices and matches, and began chanting words that were foreign to the others. Lynn trembled with fear, but Ellie was captivated, wanting to know how Justine had acquired so much information on the process. Justine brushed it off, claiming she had learned it from YouTube. However, the others suspected that Justine was lying, hiding something. As the chanting continued, nothing seemed to happen for a few tense moments. Then, abruptly, Lynn let out a blood-curdling scream, dropping her candle. In the dim light, Kayla leaned in closer to see what was happening to her friend. Lynn clutched her arm, and to their horror, a dark, inky liquid oozed from underneath her fingernails. Panicking, Justine turned on the lights, breaking the circle, a step she wasn't supposed to take. Standing menacingly behind Lynn was a shadowy figure, so dark that its facial features were obscured. It reached out with a claw-like appendage, sinking them into Lynn's arm and leg. Kayla and Ellie screamed in terror while Justine desperately tried to push the figure away. Then, the figure's eyes opened, revealing a fiery red glow. Just as Justine reached for her phone to call the police, the sinister apparition vanished into the darkness. By the time help arrived at the house, Lynn had bled out. The once inseparable trio was down to two and the remaining girls were shattered by this nightmarish event. Two years passed and Kayla finally mustered the courage to reach out to Ellie. Her heart ached with the need to reconnect with someone who had also experienced that horrific night. 
She called Ellie, and to her surprise, her friend picked up the first ring. Ellie had missed Kayla terribly, and the bond that had been fractured began to mend. Their next mission was to reach out to Justine, but when she didn't answer her phone, they felt an overwhelming concern. Fearing the worst, Kayla and Ellie decided to visit her home. When they arrived and rang the doorbell, Justine's mother answered. Worried and confused, Kayla asked, where's Justine? Her mother's face contorted in anguish and she uttered words that sent shivers down their spines. She died five years ago. Stunned and horrified, the girls struggled to process this revelation. They had been in this house just two years ago. Suddenly, the truth dawned on them. Justine had apparently orchestrated the entire ghost summoning ordeal as a way to take Lynn with her to the other side so she wouldn't have to be alone. Haunted by this revelation, Kayla and Ellie left the house. They had been unwittingly part of a macabre plan, one that would forever link them to the other side. Bound by the ghostly presence of Lynn and the entity that was Justine, they could only pray that neither would want more friends to join them. Have you ever had a scary supernatural experience at a sleepover party or while you were with your friends? Tell us your story by sending us an email at somethingscary@snarled.com. Have you ever wondered what happened to people who do bad things? Bad luck probably found them, like in this story inspired by anime war plays. The school bell rang on Friday afternoon, and so the mischief for Dante, Clark, and Sully could finally begin. They leaped onto their bikes, ready to terrorize the neighborhood. The date? It was, of course, Friday the 13th, a day shrouded in superstition, dark omens, and chaos. Leaving a trail of dust behind them, the trio parked their bikes at their favorite pizza joint where they scarfed some slices, then continued on their reckless spree. They stole mailboxes, snuck up behind unsuspecting kids, and unleashed blood-curdling screams that echoed through the quiet streets. The thrill of fear they instilled was intoxicating. It was almost as fun as TPing houses at Halloween. Just then, they stumbled upon a house with a large fall display of pumpkins, their eerie orange glow casting shadows on the porch. Dante and Clark exchanged looks, and their grins widened as they dared Sully to run up and smash them to bits. Sully, never one to back down from a dare, accepted the challenge. He took a deep breath and approached the house cautiously, well aware of the motion sensor light that guarded the pumpkins. He smashed a few, reveling in the chaos. But as the pumpkins exploded into a mess of pulp and seeds, the motion sensor light blinked on. Suddenly, the front door creaked open, revealing a darkness within. Fear surged through his veins upon hearing the sound of footsteps echoing within. The doorbell camera whirred to life, capturing his bewildered expression. A scream erupted from the house and chilled Sully's bones. In a panic, he turned to run. Dante and Clark already vanished on their bikes, their laughter following them down the street, leaving Sully to face the consequences alone. Sully's bike was in full view of the streetlight. He couldn't risk collecting it, so with no other option, he veered toward the nearby woods, seeking refuge in the darkness. He ran deep into the parkland, the trees swallowing him in shadow his breathing ragged as he sprinted away from the house and the scream. Suddenly, his hood snagged on a branch, yanking him off his feet and sending him tumbling to the ground. Lying there, bruised and disoriented, Sully took deep breaths, gasping for air. A rancid smell penetrated his nostrils, and he pawed at the grass around him. To his surprise, his fingers closed around something small and furry. With trembling hands, he pulled it up. A rabbit's foot. Lucky, he thought. Lucky that he didn't get caught. Maybe the day was turning back around. He pocketed the rabbit's foot and stood up, brushing dirt and leaves from his clothes. Looking around, he realized he was totally lost in the dark woods. It was only a matter of time before his parents would find out and punish him. Hours later, Sully finally emerged, battered and muddy, his skin covered in bites from bugs 
and he was sure he waded through poison ivy. His bike was nowhere to be found. His parents, although happy he was safe, were furious. They grounded him for the foreseeable future. How could he be so careless? After a long, hot shower, Sully climbed into bed, his body aching and his mind still consumed by the events of the Friday the 13th. He reached into his jeans pocket and pulled out the rabbit's foot, falling asleep with the grotesque charm clutched to his hand. That night, Sully's dreams were twisted and terrifying. He was chased relentlessly through a nightmarish black hole, his limbs torn from his body by unseen forces. He awoke in a cold sweat, the rabbit's foot still inside his fist. Fearful and trembling, he decided it was time to get rid of the not-so-lucky, gross little trinket. But as he tossed the rabbit's foot away, it seemed to grow, sprouting fleshy appendages, a stomach, and much more. Sully watched in horror as the grotesque transformation continued. The rabbit's foot had become a nightmarish entity, his glassy stare fixed on him. Then it was gone. The following night, Sully awoke to a chilling hiss, emanating from the air above him. He opened his eyes to find the rabbit's foot hovering, suspended by some invisible force. He followed its form up to the source, and there it was, an entire rabbit, grotesquely fused with the foot, its eyes piercing his soul. Before he could react, the abomination lunged at him, teeth bared and claws extended. Sully's screams of agony filled the room as the creature tore into his flesh, maiming him in a gruesome frenzy. As the darkness closed in around him, Sully realized the horrifying truth. He had become the unlucky victim of the cursed rabbit's foot. There was no escape from the torment that awaited him. On that fateful Friday the 13th, Sully's luck had run out, and now this loathsome entity would haunt and torture him for eternity. Have you ever behaved poorly and regretted your actions? Has karma ever come to find you? Or did you get away with your bad deeds unscathed? In our final story, join my co-host Stephanie as she tells the tale of reincarnation inspired by Janine Pipe and now animated over on youtube.com slash snarled. Reincarnation is an intriguing belief held by many, suggesting that dreams and deja vu may be fragments of memories from our past lives. While the possibility is debatable, there are fascinating accounts of individuals vividly recollecting their own past lives, making one wonder, if they ever had a past life. We're a really tight-knit family. It's myself, my little sister Tess, our mom and our grandma. Our house is filled with so much love from both our mom and grandma. We're also regular churchgoers. Don't get me wrong though, Tess and I had to go back in the day, but now that I'm older, I can stay home and take care of both of us. We get to decide if we want to go or not, which is nice because I'm not always up for it. And one day I got to be home alone with Tess and learned about her past lives. But a lot of it just seemed like stuff she had seen on TV or maybe she had learned it at school. For example, she had stories like riding in a wagon drawn by horses while wearing a yellow dress, walking through the streets of Victorian London, sitting in front of a small black and white TV as she watched the incredible moon landing unfold before her eyes. All these things were impressively descriptive and yet not impossible for a first grader to know about. And while I might've been somewhat open-minded, We did not tell my mom and gran in case they didn't approve or didn't believe her. But things started seeping in into her daily life, like referring to something in a really old fashioned way. She asked to use the loo at school. She tried to make a cup of tea with milk, which might be fine and all, except these are expressions that are commonly associated with British culture, which we are not. Sometimes she said weird stuff and my mom told her off. But when she began sleep talking in Dutch, they took a notice especially when Gran told us we had Dutch heritage. Tess looked right at mom and Gran and told them straight up, she died many times before, and in one of her past lives, she lived in Holland with our ancestors. Now, this was all rather entertaining, strange, and yet innocent until that day, Friday the 13th. Tess had been studying superstitions at school, and when she got home, she couldn't wait to ask us about black cats and knocking on wood. 
We were all sitting at the kitchen table enjoying a meal of spaghetti. Tess was also eating all the garlic bread and not sharing. So mom told her to pass it around and offer some to Gran. Gran shook her head and smiled, joking that maybe her inability to eat garlic wasn't because of indigestion, but because she might be a vampire. Mom laughed and asked Tess if she had learned about that superstition too. We were expecting Tess to laugh along, but instead, she had a very weird, serious look on her face. No, Granny, you can't eat garlic because it reminds you of when I was in your tummy. I burst out laughing at the odd statement, but Mom and Gran were shocked. What, what do you mean, Tess? Asked Mom. You were never in Gran's tummy. You were in mine because I'm your mommy. Tess looked at Mom like she was dense. Gran stayed silent. I know that, Mommy. But before I was in your tummy, I was in Gran's tummy. But I was going to be a boy, so I choked and died. Then Gran nearly died too, so I had to wait quite a while before I could go into your tummy. Gran let out a sob as mom's eyes grew wide with fear. Later, mom told me something that only a handful of people knew. About 25 years ago, Gran had fallen pregnant. It had been a miracle since after mom had been born, Gran and grandpa had not been able to conceive again. But in a tragic turn of events, around eight months into the pregnancy, the baby had died. The umbilical cord had wrapped around its neck and the baby had choked in the womb. The surgery after had complications and Gran had flatlined for a few minutes. It had all been very traumatic and had never really been spoken of since. And Gran had never told anyone that the baby had been a boy, not even my mom. There was no way Tess could have known about this and it seems completely impossible that a six-year-old would make it up. And the even weirder thing, the due date of that baby 15 years before had been Friday the 13th. This week's podcast stories were edited by Sarah Lukasiewicz, Janine Pipe, and Stephanie Strange. Narration by Blair Bathory and Stephanie Strange. Audio edited and mixed by Fitz Harris. Additional audio editing by Calvin Linderman. Art and graphics by Irma Richardson. Produced by Anna Villalobos. Executive produced by Gail Gilman. Music by Sapphire Sandalo and Calvin Linderman. <laughs>